um, I'm, I've been asked to talk about brain gym, um, for literacy and numeracy. And, um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background as to what brain gym is, because often people have a little bit of an idea, but um, I just want to expand that out and, um, and show you a few brain gym movements that you can take away with you tonight. Um, and talk a little bit about brain gym and stress and what stress actually does to the brain. So I think the, um, what Rosemary and Fiona were talking about sort of links in really well and uh, so you hopefully go home with a little bit more knowledge. Um, some of the, um, and so some of the, a little bit, you know, has been covered, but in terms of literacy and numeracy, um, you know, there are, there are quite a few underlying skills that, that as teachers, um, being in, the, in, the, in a school situation, and I'm talking about sort of the one to six, but it does encompass much wider <coughs> areas than that, um, children definitely, there, there's, there is a, a trend that children are not really ready at five for academic learning and, um, and in actual fact um, the brain isn't really, children aren't develop me, developmentally and neurologically always ready for the type of academic learning that we're presenting um, in our school. Some kids do really well and there are those that that struggle or are more likely to get there when they're about seven, which is where the brain is reaches another stage of maturity. So we, we are actually putting some of our children under a bit of stress when they start, and particularly boys. And um, if we don't really nurture our boys in those first two years of their school life, then they can feel really unsuccessful often for the rest of their, um, for the rest of their school life. Um, so, so a lot of uh, these sort of things are underlying um, challenges in literacy and numeracy, um, and some of those are physical, uh, physical skills, um, like the postural aspects, um, developmental delay, inability to cross the midline, which doesn't really, f doesn't really fully come in until about age seven. So if you've got seven-year-olds who can't do a cross crawl movement, for example, or aren't crossing the midline, you know that you have, you know, you've got a fairly serious problem. But ideally, in a preschool situation, somebody started to notice that that child is having challenges in that area. Um, visual and auditory processing. So if any of you are in the school situation and you get a report from an ed psych, there will usually be a lot of information about visual processing and auditory processing. And, and that's always a challenge for a, for a teacher to think about, well, what does that actually mean in the school context? How do I, how do I work around those sorts of needs? Um, another area is actually being able to use two eyes and use two eyes together. And that's a highly, um, an area that's really undiagnosed, that children actually have, um, have visual issues and that, that can be underlying sort of challenges with, with, um, um, with literacy and numeracy. Mm. So am I, where am I pointing yeah, this? Anywhere. Anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is that? One there. Yeah. Oh, that one. Sideways. Oh, yeah, okay, so. next one. Okay, so this is um, probably a fairly difficult for those of you who are in schools. You might quite often see, um, see you know, a little fellow like this who's frustrated, doesn't know what's going on. He's Monday morning, he's got to write a story, yet again, you know, <laughs> about his weekend. And then it's going to be math, and then it's going to be spelling, and, you know, so, so the day goes on. Oh. That one, no? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about brain gym, because then I'm going to talk about how some, how some, there are some brain gym movements that can relate to um, to helping literacy and numeracy. So, um, so what is brain gym? So, anyone, just a show of hands, if you've heard the word or you've done some brain gym in your centres. Wow. That's talking to the converted. <laughs> okay, so um, often people think of brain gym as being cross-crawl movements. It's one of the movements that's quite well known. And another movement for writing called lazy eights. And uh, so, yes, that's, that's part of it. 
but um, just to expand that out a little bit more, so essentially there are 26 movements and um, it's part of um, a sensory motor program that was developed by Dr. Paul Dennison and Gail Dennison in the United States and has continued to evolve um, over that time. It's, uh, it's being used globally <laughs> and so you could go to Russia or Germany or China or Korea or France or you know, many places all over the world and in school situations or early childhood situations or other, many other situations people would be using brain gym. In fact, um, a couple of years ago I was watching a documentary on um, Peter Hillary and he was reviewing, this is pre-earthquake obviously, and he was reviewing the work of his father and the schools in, um, in um, I don't know whether it was Kathmandu or somewhere, and they showed a group of, um, a group of Nepalese doing it, looked like they were starting out doing a traditional dance, and then the next thing I noticed that they were actually all doing cross crawl and a whole lot of brain gym movements. So I thought, well, you know, even in the Himalayas, people do brain gym. <laughs> so um, in, in recent years, um, we've learned a lot more about the brain and information about neuroscience has become a lot more available for, for people to use. And basically, the brain gym movements are the application of neuroscience. And when Paul Dennison started in the 1980s, and those of us who trained at that time, um, it was a little bit of blind faith because we knew that we knew doing the brain gym movements actually helped, but we didn't actually have the huge the body of knowledge that we have now. But now we have a lot more information um, about the brain and and how um, and taking that information and really applying it to a learning situation, not just not just doing what we've already done, but when a child can't learn what is actually going on at a neurodevelopmental level, what is stopping them from participating fully as, you know, as we would expect. Um, the brain gym movements themselves are part of a bigger system called educational kinesiology. So that's, um, so I'm a registered educational kinesiologist. <laughs> and uh, which is a relatively new, um, well, there's a few of us around, um, not that many, but, um, but in other places, in Europe, for example, um, you know, lots of people go to a kinesiologist, like they would go to a naturopath or something like that, but in New Zealand, um, we're a little bit, um, a bit light on the ground. So basically, the essential paradigm is that movement and learning are interrelated, and that you can change the way your brain functions by, by moving and so there is more and more um, evidence particularly in terms of aging that the way that you keep your brain active particularly in this um, technological world that we live in is to continue to move for as long as is, is possible because that's actually what keeps your brain um, functioning well and <coughs> uh, producing new brain cells and making new connections which used to be thought that you weren't you sort of weren't able to do that after a certain age, but now we know that actually, you know, you can do that for um, the rest of your life, which is encouraging when you, <laughs> when you think that you're going to, that your memory is not so good. Okay, so, oh, okay. Um, these are the 26 movements, okay, there are 26 movements all together. I'm going to show you a couple tonight, and um, they are in different categories. And uh, Fiona and Rosemary were talking about the midline of the body, the vertical midline of the body. We have other midlines. And all these movements here at the top involve crossing over the vertical midline of the body. So if you've got um, children that, that are in your setting, whether that's school or early childhood, um, and they're not crossing the midline, you can use some of these movements to encourage that um, the development of that skill at a neurological level, okay, as well as a gross motor level. Um, these movements here are called lengthening movements, and what, what the body does under stress is it tightens all the muscles down the back of the body, and these movements actually lengthen and help to relax those muscles. So believe it or not, even four-year-olds are stressed 
Often four-year-olds and five-year-olds are quite tight around their shoulders, and you'll probably be talking about that a bit more. Um, so, you know, we think that, that tight shoulders and, and big-time stress is, is the, the realm of adults, but actually it's not. Often little kids are really, really tight in the musculature of their body. Um, these movements here are for relax, for calming and relaxing, and these movements here are based on acupuncture points, um, which um, Paul Dennison called buttons, and um, they help to um, sort of activate the energy systems in the body and and um, and get things moving around. Okay, um, the learn is very much part of the process, so we, we even when introducing range of movements to early childhood or five-year-olds you get them to notice what's happened once they've done brain gym movement. So they actually engage in their own learning and start to monitor their own learning. That's a, an essential part of what we do. Um, in a one-to-one -one session, we, we work with goal setting. Uh, you can also do that in a um, classroom um, situation. And we use the word notice quite a lot, like notice what happened when you had a drink of water, notice what happened when you did some cross call, etc. Mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So, which is actually um, in line with the curriculum, um, self, you know, um, self-directed learners. Um, Fiona talked a little bit about the brain and what we really want in very simplistic terms when I'm talking to kids. Often um, I talk about the, the top parts of the brain, the picture side, you can't see it actually that clearly on there, but um, words and numbers, so words and one side, numbers, um, sorry, w words and numbers on one side, pictures and ideas in another, and part of the goal of doing midline movements is to get the left and right sides of the brain talking to each other. So little kids are actually really interested in the brain, they really, they want to know, they want to know how their brain works, and so they like that, um, they like that information. It's another, just a side view of the brain. So in brain gym and kinesiology, we actually don't just look at the top part of the brain, we look at the main three structures of the brain, um, being the cerebral cortex, the midbrain, and the brainstem. And we know that under stress, when a, a, a brain or in a body is under stress, whether that's emotional stress, environmental stress, um, whatever sort of stress that the brain actually shuts down and goes into a survival mode or it goes into fight or flight, okay? So, and that's something that I think in education we don't really take enough notice of and we do have a brain gym movement for, for stress. Okay, so here's some, um, this is the work of Carl, uh, Carla Hannaford who's written a lot about the brain and... Um, um, and stress, effect of stress on the brain. And so there's a whole lot of things that actually impact um, on our performance. And there's been a lot of, um, just recently, about mouldy classrooms. So that mm -hmm. is actually a stressor for some kids to be in a mouldy, damp classroom, um, sitting in desks that are actually really badly designed, mm -hmm. <laughs> spending a lot of day, you know, your day hunched over, um, having a poor diet, having the wrong diet. All those things are actually stress on the system. So, you know, are the students ready for learning? Uh, that's, and often I will do a continuum with kids just to get them to mark, or, you know, or adults um, to mark themselves on, uh, on there. Okay, so I'm just going to take you through a couple of movements, all right? And first of all, we, we always start with water, because one of the main things is that we teach in Brain Gym is that you need to drink water to not only hydrate the body, but also to hydrate the brain. So if you have water beside you, that's really great. <laughs> if you haven't, I'd like you to imagine that you're drinking a glass of beautiful, clean, fresh spring water. All right? So if you have water, have a drink. Um, if you haven't, just imagine that you're... <laughs> And you're probably going to feel really thirsty for the rest of my presentation. <laughs> okay. Um, so in this diagram, there's some information about all the things that um, that water does. And actually, the brain is about 75% water. So when kids in a classroom get a headache in the afternoon, it's more than likely that they're dehydrated. And I do go in and out of classrooms. And classrooms in the afternoon often are really 
<laughs> smelly. <laughs> There's no oxygen left, and and you know everybody looks half asleep. So. Um, and probably, you know, there's a high degree of dehydration. Mm -hmm. In winter time, you know, we often want to have warm drinks and Milo's and teas and coffees and, well, us as adults. But kids often forget to drink and some, some children are patently aversive to drinking water. It's certainly much better than it was um, before water became fashionable, but, but uh, the body really needs water, not milk not juice, not um, refresh, not whatever, but it actually needs water to really function. Okay, so I'm just going to take you through those movements really quickly. So now you're feeling really nicely hydrated from your lovely tall glass of water. <laughs> okay, and um, so we're just going to go around in the circle, and so water obviously is to energise. The next movement is... Um, is called brain buttons, okay? And so you pop your hand on your tummy. And actually, before you do that, I want you to just notice how you're feeling at this point of time. You have been very attentive and sitting, so, um, you know, you're thinking, I didn't have any dinner, I'm a little bit hungry, or I wish, this, I wish they'd all move along quickly because I actually want to go home, or I've got a really big day tomorrow, or I've had a really big, or whatever, okay? Just notice that for yourself. So, hand on your tummy, make a sort of a C shape there, just across your, um, across your chest, just under the collarbones. And if you push in there a little bit, it'll be quite tender, okay? And so, so if that's the midline of your body, you just thumb and first finger on either side. And you just, these are your brain buttons, and you're just going to give that a little rub. If your eyes are feeling a little bit fixed on the screen, just, you could just move your eyes gently from side to side. Really good exercise, really good to do before reading in a classroom. And then you change hands and do the other side. In brain gym, we like to match everything up so that you do things on one side and then you do things on the other. You can, okay, all right. And now I'd like you to stand up. I know you haven't got a lot of room there. Okay, on the... Um, um, all, most of our material comes from America. The um, Educational Kinesiology Foundation disseminates all the information and it's all trademarked. But, and so in this process, which is called PACE, um, we have four different movements. One of the things that I've found is that if you start to introduce cross-lateral movements to a group of kids, there's quite a few kids who can't do it. They're not actually ready to cross the midline. So I always start with a one-sided movement and in brain gym we call this the puppet. So you just lift one side and then the other and you can actually count. And so if you can count in Māori, it actually slows it down. So if, those of you teachers, so tahi, rua, toru, fa, ma, ono, fitu, waru, iwa, Okay, very good. All right, and now we're going to do some cross crawl movements. And again, with a group of kids, if you introduce cross crawl movements, you will see lots of variations of cross crawl. Um, the ideal cross crawl movement is a torso twist with the knees pointing forward. So, just a few of those movements. So some of you might have had a little brain scramble there. <laughs> okay, all right, and have a seat. And the last movement that we use for calming, refocusing, de-stressing is called the hookup. And um, so you just do a thumbs up sign, a thumbs down sign, cross your wrists, cross your ankles, interlock your fingers, and you can either place it in your hands or tuck it under. Okay, just, you can choose and just do a little bit of breathing. So we'll just suck out the rest of the oxygen that's left. Here. <laughs> okay. Okay, and this is, um, it's actually quite a beautiful thing in a classroom to see 25 kids sitting calmly <laughs> in the whole cup. <laughs> it's something that doesn't happen often. Okay and then uncross and put your fingertips together. So I just want you to notice while you're just sitting like that, do you feel a little bit more alert? 
Do you, does your brain feel a little bit more awake? Does you, has your posture improved a little bit? Okay, and do you feel really thirsty or do you feel hydrated? <laughs> thirsty, okay. All right, so that's pace and that's where we start, okay? Um, and teaching range of movements and also in a clinical situation, one to one. How am I going for time? Two minutes? Okay, right. I'm just going to whiz through this quickly. I won't demonstrate these. Um, we have a group of brain gym movements, uh, which are the buttons that we can use for reading. So, so these um, activate the left and right sides of the brain and also get the eyes moving, which is what we want to happen in a reading context. We want eyes moving from left to right. Lots of children, even seven, eight, nine-year-olds, are not doing, cannot move their eyes bilaterally. A lot of them can't even hold their head up and move their eyes, let alone, let alone just move their eyes. So it's a really good exercise just to do a little bit of basic tracking if you, if you have a child who's really struggling a bit with reading. Mm. Um, and we, this, these are lazy eight, so we can do lazy eight movements with eyes. Brain gym for writing. So if you came and did a, if you did a course, these are the sort of things that we would go through in a, bit, a lot more detail and you'd experience it. Um, so... Those are the postural things that, um, that Fiona talked about with handwriting and a couple of brain gym exercises are cross crawl, standing or sitting, um, the owl which is releasing the tension around the shoulders and lazy eights um, which, which is the movement that lots of people know um, where you follow your thumb in a, like an infinity sign, keeping the head still but watching, um, watching the thumb or a target. Um, often we use a racetrack because that's more motivating, that, that works well at early childhood as well um, and lots of kids like zooming around a racetrack um, but you can do it in lots of other ways as well. And uh, whiteboards are really good, whiteboards and whiteboard pens um, that you know, makes it a very tidy activity in a classroom or with a small group. Um, you can do, um, you can use lazy eights in that way. So. Just, and I'm not going to go through that, but that's a little bit of a simplistic model of the left and right brain, but we do know that the left and right upper cortices of the brain do actually have different <coughs> functions. So when we're doing reading and writing and decoding for maths and all those sort of things, um, and you know, adding and you know, subtracting, we actually need to use our whole brain, not <coughs> half of our brain. Um, the brain gym for stress release, that's the, the hookup that I've just shown you. And if those of you are in classrooms and you want the kids to be quiet, you just add a little tongue on the roof of the mouth, okay? Stop some talking, keeps <laughs> them quiet. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.